of Astronomy Days. I'm Carrie, an educator with the museum, and I am very excited to be with you here today on this Tuesday. So we um, always start our programs with a really fun icebreaker question. So my question for you today, um, in anticipation of this program, if an asteroid was coming towards the Earth and going to make impact, what would you do to stop it? So if you had all the, resor all the resources of the governments of the world, how would you plan to stop this asteroid from hitting Earth? So put that response in the chat. And while we're waiting for your answers to come in, I'm going to go through and do a very quick Zoom tutorial. Um, so we do have live captions for this program. If you'd like to see the captions, click on the closed caption button at the bottom, and you'll and it'll um, and you'll you can click show subtitle. And then the subtitles are going to look like that. Um, now we also want to make sure that we have an ideal viewing um, uh, view of the program. So you're going to go up to view options and click, um, you're going to click side by side mode. And that just takes our pictures and puts it to the side so it's not obscuring the um, presentation. And then you can move with this bar over here on the side, you can make the presentation smaller and the person bigger or vice versa. That's up to you. Um, and lastly, we want to hear from you in the chat. So ask your questions, make your comments, but make sure that all your comments and questions are relevant to the program and be kind and respectful to everyone. Be a good digital citizen. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and let's check out some of our fun. Oh, it looks like we got a ton of answers. So let's see. Um, lasers, we got the Malone said lasers. Um, force field, a massive metal shield on a rocket and knock it away. Ooh, that's, that's Ruxin. That's a, that's a, a creative one. I use a spaceship and circle around the asteroid over and over at full speed in the rocket. So the rocket would make the asteroid move and set it for a different course. That sounds like Superman, a metal eating fish. I like that. <laughs> Destroy the asteroid with lasers or send rockets to speed up earth or earth's orbit. So Alan, you'll have to tell us bombs. I would get faster and do NASA objects. Nukes. If it is far away, um, use the sun paint, use the sun to push the asteroid. <laughs> so I, ask NASA. These are good answers. I'm going to address these. <laughs> awesome. Okay. So wait, so we've, so we've got some uh, from YouTube. So I'm going to go through those. I don't want anybody to feel left out. So Cindy says, send nuclear weapons to deflect it. And Glenn says, launch a mass attractor to ride alongside the asteroid to divert it. And then <laughs> Melinda says, use a ton of cushions. <laughs> okay, I love this one. <laughs> use a ton of cushions on Earth so when it lands, it does not destroy the Earth. And then Tyler says, I would use dart, which I assume you know what that is. So we had I'm, some fun answers. I'm Alan. Talk about dart, yes. All right. Well let me well before we before we start getting right down into it, I'm going to introduce you. <laughs> so Alan Rich is one of our NASA JPL solar system ambassadors and he has been working with the museum on astronomy days and other astronomy programming for as long as I've worked with the museum. So 14 years, Alan's been doing these wonderful programs with us. So everyone, please welcome Alan. And Alan, take it away. Tell us what the right answer is. Okay. Some of these answers are so close. Somebody has been keeping up with NASA missions, DART. Um, this, is a, this is a really good time to um, talk about asteroids because there's a couple of things going on right now. Uh, there's uh, the new movie that's out about the killer comet or asteroid that's heading to the Earth. It's like, don't look down or don't look over there or don't look somewhere. Whatever which is, that which is an adult movie. Just to, I'm just going to clarify oh. that is for, for the adults in the audience, not for the children. Right. It has naughty words in it and destruction of the Earth and mass death and things. So I guess it's not a real kids movie. But um so that movie's out, and people are talking about that. And NASA has a mission now. Somebody mentioned this in the uh, icebreaker question, DART. 
That's called the double asteroid redirection test. It's uh, the official name of what it's gonna do. It's a kinetic impactor. So we have this spacecraft that's headed towards this uh, asteroid right now, and it's gonna deliberately crash into it and see how we can affect the trajectory of that asteroid. I mean, this is not an asteroid that's headed for us and it's not a danger to us. In fact, we don't have any known asteroids within the next, uh, here's a here's an interesting little thing. We don't have within the next 100 years any known asteroids that are going to threaten us, but we only know about 40% of the asteroids and have them tracked. So at least half or more of the asteroids that are out there that could potentially be dangerous someday, we don't even know about them or have them tracked. So this DART spacecraft is going to impact this little asteroid uh, probably in September. And we're going to see, so that's, that's like the latest thinking on how to redirect asteroids. There's a couple of other ways to do it. Uh, one is called the Yarkovsky effect, is where um, asteroids, when they travel through space, they don't just travel like planets and moons in nice, smooth, circular orbits like that. They travel kind of like if you blow up a balloon and let it go and it goes like that. They, and so it's when they're doing that, it's kind of hard to predict where they're going to be two years from now. And the reason they do that is because the, it's called the Yarkovsky effect. The sun heats them up on one side and they're tumbling like crazy. And the sun heats them up on one side. And then when that hot side turns away from the sun, that heat that's radiated back into space as it cools off is like a little bit of rocket thrust. So that's where they don't just like, well, Planets and moons are big and heavy, and it's hard to do anything about their orbits, and their orbits are nice and smooth, but asteroids aren't that way. So a one cool way that has been thought of is to do an artificial, artificial Yarkovsky effect. If you see an asteroid and it seems to be <laughs> headed right for us, maybe, kind of, it's hard to tell, then if you went up with a basically a spacecraft full of some really bright paint, like white or silver paint and exploded that on one side of it, that would change the Zarkovsky effect and it wouldn't go where it's going. If you think it's coming towards you, it might make it go somewhere else. And so you could run into it with something and knock it off its course, like the dark spacecraft. You could paint one side of it and change the natural flight pattern of it. Uh, but nuking it is probably not a good idea because there have been a lot of science, a lot of scientists have done models on nuking asteroids and kind of come out with the result that it'd be better off if you got hit by, if we got hit by one big asteroid instead of that asteroid split up into a whole bunch of smaller pieces and probably would be better not to nuke them. So did anybody else have any other uh uh, things here. I, I, there were so, so many people that mentioned things. I wanted to. Uh, you know, we had a really great. Uh, there's a, a metal fish. <laughs> now, the metal eating cushions. Fish. Um, NASA's been working on a metal eating fish, but we're not getting very far with that. <laughs> <laughs> but I love that answer. <laughs> I know. Uh, so, a mass attractor to ride alongside and divert it. Yeah. Like put a rocket on it and. Uh, mm -hmm. A land a rocket engine on it and then just like make it a rocket and uh fly that's yeah, that's an idea yeah i assume lasers probably would have the same effect as nuclear weapons <laughs> breaking Blow it up, it up. Not, yeah, not great. yeah yeah lasers in space what about speeding up earth's orbit what would happen to us if we did that well you need a pretty big rocket to speed up earth's orbit so i don't think we ought to be putting our money there <laughs> and you don't want to speed it up anyway, because orbital dynamics, if you sped up the orbit of the Earth, if you were even able to do that, you would change the orbit around. You speed up and you're going to like change the orbit around whatever you're orbiting. In our case, it's the sun. And that would mess up our weather and all kinds of things. I would imagine it would have uh, deleterious effects on the Earth <laughs> to do yeah. that. Yes, whatever that word you just said means, uh, which I assume is kind of like bad. Uh, bad yeah. effects. <laughs> it would have bad effects. Bad effects, yeah. And then, um, 
Yeah. Well, and uh, so what about a force field? That was another creative solution. <laughs> yeah. I don't know about the physics of that, but yeah, there's so much energy in a, if you, if you have a metal asteroid, that's the size of even a car there and it's coming at us at a hundred thousand miles an hour, the speed and the weight, there's so much energy in that, that it's a, uh, it's going to be, you, you know, yeah. You want to just try to make it miss. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Got it. So now we all know what to do if an asteroid's coming at us. Yep. We need to try to make it miss us. Got yep. it. So what I'm really supposed to be talking to you about today is NASA. We have this at JPL, Jet Propulsion Labs in Pasadena. We have this suite of programs called EYES. And one of them, we've got a new one. It's called Eyes on Asteroids, which lets you go out and you, you can, I have the URL for you here. The, the URL is going to appear on your screen. And fortunately not clickable. <laughs> oh, you can, this is, yeah, it's not clickable, but this is 3D. Look. It is. I like it. I am a professional, and when you cl click on one of my presentations, you get 3D effects and everything. So eyes.nasa.gov, that is... Ah, the there. R, R got the real clickable link in the chat for us. Thanks, R. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, well, well, this is more professional right here. This is 3D. Oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> so behind me here is the... the the main one is eyes on the solar system. But before I show you these things, there's eyes on the solar system, there's eyes on Earth, there's eyes on alien planets, and the new one, eyes on asteroids. It lets you, it's really cool, and it'll even show you asteroids that are going to do close flybys to the Earth, and you can see, you can watch them. You can put a virtual camera on them and see what the Earth would look by, like if you were riding this asteroid past the Earth. They're really cool. And they're, but all four of them are, the cool thing about them is they're in scale and they're in real time, which means like I've got one eyes on the solar system behind me here and you can see the solar system. There's the sun and some of the planets and uh, a big asteroid over here. And this is real time. So when you use one of our eyes programs, you'll see space as it looks right now. Say, for instance, you had a friend who is an alien from another galaxy, and he's coming to visit you, and you're on the phone with him, and he's like, uh, I'm lost. I can't find the Earth. I see Saturn, I think. But you could tell him to click on eyes.nasa.gov and go look at the solar system, and this is, by real time, this is exactly where everything is. So you could say, all right, you see it now? All right, so see Mars? Go to Mars, hang a left, and the Earth is the second planet on the left. They go, okay, and hurry up, because mom says pizza's about ready. So you could th that's what this real time means. And you can change at the bottom here, you can change the date way back into the past and way into the future so that if there was a spacecraft event or a flyby of an asteroid, or some other thing that happens out in space that was like five years ago, you can change the date and go watch that as if you were there live. So um, the scale thing too is important. Like you can make a model of the solar system and hang it from your bedroom uh, ceiling. Like a big orange ball, there's the sun, and then there's Mercury, Venus, and Earth is like a grapefruit or something. That's not scale. If you've ever seen anybody make a scale to both size and distance model of the solar system, you've got like, you need like a lot of land. If you put like a light bulb at the end of a football field and that's the sun, the earth would be like a little bug on the 40 yard line, something like that. If you wanted to do the whole solar system, you would need to go from, and to get the sun and Pluto, you would have to go not only do the scale thing first to get things the right size, but you'd have to start in Raleigh and Pluto would be way out in like Fuquay or something. So 
the size, you can't just do that with things hanging from your, your school classroom or your bedroom. If you want to get size and scale, and then we got real time here. So we've got uh, the eyes programs are all real time and, and scale correct. So, so Alan, I'm going to um, say I, we just discovered a new program that is um, if the moon were the size of a pixel. And I'm going to drop that um, link in the chat because it is one of the most fun things I have seen lately. You um, you scroll on your on your computer. You just sit there and scroll. And if the moon were the size of a pixel, it does both size and distance. And so I only had time. I've only had time to get. I got past Saturn. <laughs> <laughs> but I, but you sit there, you know, and scroll through, and he has little notes that pop up, talking of essentially saying that space, there's just a lot of space in space, mm. and these objects are very small in comparison, and so it really gives you that sense of scale. It, it's it's very cool. So please, uh, yeah, check that out after the program. It's really fun to play with. Yeah, I want to see that too. I haven't heard of that. Yeah. Okay, so let me go. Uh, I'll email to, it to you. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> You've got my email. Yeah. <laughs> Let me go to our uh, share the screen here, and I'll walk you through these eyes programs and how you can use them all yourself. Okay. Share my screen. Here we go. So this we have a comment in the chat that says it's, it's, it seems like you're a football fanatic because you've been using a lot of football metaphors. Is that true, Alan? Have I? No, I don't really watch football. <laughs> I do. Uh, <laughs> let's see. What sports do I do? I do soccer. I used to be a soccer coach, but now I don't really get into football. Uh, that's the only sport. I can't play anything because I'm a big klutzy nerd, so I can't do anything myself. So, so anyway, this is when you go to eyes.nasa.gov. This is the screen that you'll come up to and You'll you can click on this is eyes on the solar system, and again this is look there's the Voyager spacecraft down here. You can uh, Jupiter Saturn. This is what it looks like. You can zoom in, zoom out, and you can down here at the bottom. Um, here's some destination cheats that you can go to. Um, you can fly around and find things yourself, but that could take a while. Um, but the the cheats that take you directly to things. There's solar system objects, land asteroids, a spacecraft, and we have a cool thing in here. If you go spacecraft, other missions, uh, I help put this in here myself. The uh, SpaceX Elon Musk car. You know Elon Musk, the Tesla guy. He launched his car into space, um, and we put this on here. And there it is. And I'll use this as kind of an example on some of the things. Uh, and like I was telling you, I'm going to have to light this up. Um, like I was telling you about his car is dark. I need to get some light on it. Nope, nope, nope. Which one of these does that? Um, Excuse me. I'm going to try so, to light it because this is what his car looks like. That, I have a question from Emma. Are all the spaceships that are on the um, in the EYES program, are they actually flying right now? Uh, yes. If they're on here, they are uh, flying and where they are. Um, so, for instance, uh, I can show you a couple of them. There's a... Um, uh, well, I'll tell you about this in a minute, but here I've lit this up. There's a, on the far right, you can light things up because space is mostly dark. So <laughs> if you arrived at something like I got to Elon's car here and it was dark, that's what it really is out there at the moment. So, uh, but this is it. And this is what um, the, the, the motion is real. And if you were sitting in that car right now, this is what you would see. And I'm turning it around with my trackpad here to show you to find the rest of the solar system. And there's Mercury, Venus, and Earth. Um, if you can take these names and orbit lines off, and that would be exactly what space would look like if you were sitting in Elon's car right now. Uh, 
So we have another question. So um, they ask, how fast do they go? And so I assume you mean like the different um, the different spaceships or starships that are out there. And I assume, Alan, they go at different speeds. Is that correct? Or Yes. And I just uh, clicked on something. You were clairvoyant, whoever asked that question. <laughs> I was getting ready to demonstrate how to tell how fast something is going. And how you, cool is that? You right click on it and this. you right click on two different things. So I wanted to know uh, how fast uh, Elon's car is traveling compared to Earth. So I clicked on Elon's car and Earth, and I get this popped up. Uh, he is His car is currently 232 million something miles away from us. You can see it moving. He's getting a little bit further away. When I started blabbing about this, it was like 2 million, blah, 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 Yeah, it looks like it's going more than a mile a second. Is that right. right? It's going, compared to the Earth, it's going 107,000 miles per hour. Compared, to, and this is, and that brings up a neat little factoid. I, I should have asked this as the icebreaker question when you guys entered. What is the fastest car mankind has ever made? And it would be, <laughs> by a long shot, Elon Musk's Tesla, which is in space now traveling at 107,000 miles per hour. That is by far the fastest car anybody's ever made. Um, but when you ask how fast something's going in space, that's like how fast compared to what? Not like most of us are like comparing things to uh, the earth. So that's what I just did here. But if you compared, I mean, that's kind of like, well, we think earth is so important because we live here. But if I wanted to, compare how fast Elon's car was going to the sun, that'd be a different number. So it's interesting. So how fast are we going? I guess, yeah. So how fast is the earth going? Yeah. I mean, uh, this is a, a kind so it's of all cool, relative, right? It's all relative. But then, uh, I mean, another cool question you can ask yourself is how you're sitting in your chair or, um, or your couch or wherever you're sitting and you look at somebody and go, oh, you're sitting on a couch. How fast are you going? And they would go, well, duh, I'm not going anything. I'm going zero. I'm sitting on a couch. Well, no, you're not. Because the earth is, you're, you're sitting on the earth, and the closer you are to the equator, the faster you're spinning around as the earth spins. And that's, what, 7,000 miles an hour. And then add that to the speed that the earth is traveling as it orbits the sun, which is uh, lots of thousands of miles per hour. As you can tell, I don't know the exact number. And then you add that to the speed that our whole solar system is traveling through our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy. And then guess what? The Milky Way galaxy is traveling through space. So if you add all that stuff up, that you're sitting on a chair or sitting on your couch, you're going, you are moving at hundreds of thousands of miles per hour. You're not sitting still and going zero. So it's all relative to if you you could break that down if you wanted to do some math and say, well, how fast are you going compared to the universe or the galaxy? But how fast while well, you're sitting in your chair? But if you're just going to compare your speed, how fast are you going compared to Earth? Yeah, you are going zero. But um, it's all that's that's one of the problems with space flight or one of the things you have to consider when you're talking about uh, spaceships that we send up going from one planet to another. Well, how fast is that spaceship going? Um, we've got a Mars. Uh, when we've got Mars rockets going to Mars, robots that we're sending to Mars, how fast is that traveling? Well, you have to go at least 25,000 miles to get miles an hour to get away from the Earth. So compared to Earth, you might be going 30,000 miles an hour. But then as you approach Mars, how fat, then it doesn't really matter how fast you're going compared to the Earth. It's it's way back there. That's where you came from, but you're not going back there. So Earth doesn't matter. What matters to you now is if, if you're a robot on your way to Mars, is how fast are you going compared to Mars, which might be just a couple thousand miles an hour. And by the time you get to the ground, you better be zero or you're going to crash. So all a matter of where you're going, where you're coming from, what you care about, our Mars robots don't care about Earth anymore. They're gone. They're not going back. So that's a good question. All right, so we have so a few more questions. So, so I'm going to, before we move on past the, the car, we have some car questions. So we have a question from a third grade class. Why did he do it? So why did Elon Musk launch his car? 
because Elon is crazy. No, <laughs> <laughs> no that's the real answer. But so I'll give you another answer. Um, well, uh, hmm, I, I don't know. <laughs> for, for fun, just 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 to see if he could do it. <laughs> just to see if he could do it, and to, you know, I mean, it's just fun. Uh, he yeah. had a, he owns a car company. He owns Tesla, so he's got a whole bunch of Teslas. So he might as well launch one into space. <laughs> but he's got this. Uh, it's it's not doing. One of the inaccuracies about our program here is this car of his has been in space for a while now. And it looks all pretty in this picture, but it's not because you know how when you leave your car sitting in your driveway for a few years, you'll start to get cracks in your dashboard and your tires will turn gray and get cracked and your paint fades. Well, in space, that's a whole lot worse because the radiation and the heat, we've got spaceships in space that it's like it, the physics, physics of heat is weird in space. Like you've got a spaceship in space, like the James Webb taste, uh, taste, I can't say James <laughs> Webb space telescope. It always comes out tape telescope or something. Anyway, we've got, <laughs> we just launched the James Webb space telescope into space. I'm going to talk about that in a presentation like this tomorrow. So if you're in space, you, your spaceship has got, in the case of James Webb, there's a 450 degrees Fahrenheit di difference in the side of your spaceship that's pointed towards the sun and the side that's in the dark. It's not like here, you know, you put something outside in the sun and the whole, you know, it's going to be a little hotter on the side that's facing the sun, but, you know, uh, heat conducts and the, the air around it conducts. So it's not going to be that much difference. But in space, one thing, like Elon's car, the side that's pointed to the sun is probably about 350 to 400 degrees Fahrenheit. And all you got to do is rotate around into the dark, and that drops to like 50, 100 degrees below zero. So that's some cool stuff about space flight. When you're building spaceships, you have to know it's going to be really hot on one side and really cold on the other side. Did I answer somebody's it, question? Yeah, no, yeah, no. A bunch of people were asking why it's not damaged or how it can how it could be out on the outside of the rocket. And uh, oh yeah, it's um, damaged really bad. Um, so it doesn't look real and nice. So do we? Do yeah, and so do we? I, I mean, are, does he have a? Is he sending pictures back of it as it goes through space? Uh, I don't think so. Okay, so we just assume it looks bad. We don't. Yeah, actually. we know. <laughs> we know yeah. it looks bad. Yeah. Um, Okay, but anyway, I need to get back and uh, yes, yes, and help you guys on how to use these eyes. We, got, we all got very caught up in the car. <laughs> <laughs> I know everybody does. Everybody likes to talk about Elon. I mean, how how often do people launch their own car into space? That's pretty cool. <laughs> exactly. Well, never. I mean, he did it. <laughs> I mean, nobody will ever do that again. If you uh, right click on tours and features up here, it uh, there's so many different things you can do with this. Um, oopsie, I didn't mean to do that. Now, are we back to full screen here? Okay, uh, I showed you the destinations down at the bottom where you can go to things. Uh, I showed you how you can tell anything in space, uh, how far it is from you and the speed it's traveling compared to you. Uh, there's even a feature down here where you can put uh, like small things like asteroids. When we go into eyes on the asteroids in a few minutes, uh, there's some asteroids that are literally the size of your house and cars and things. So you can put in space uh, a, um, a football stadium. There I go talking about football again, but I didn't do it. It's a football stadium, a car, or a scientist. So you've got a scientist wearing a lab coat, coat and a Porsche and the Rose Bowl Stadium in Pasadena, which are all things you find a whole lot of in Pasadena and Los Angeles. Scientists, NASA scientists, Porsches, and the Rose Bowl Stadium where the Rose Bowl Bowl game and Rose Bowl parade is all from Pasadena. You can take any one of those from Pasadena and put it in space right next to things and see the size of this little asteroid compared to a football stadium, a car, or a scientist. Um, and down here, I told you you can change the speed and you can, oh, yeah, this is cool. Um, there is a uh, home field over here, which I need to go out of this because I've got to get to this. Be right back. Um, if you go to the home field here, 
which you know. On second thought, let's not go to the home field. Let's go somewhere else. Um, you can always click on the top left like that if you get lost. And goes, well, I don't know why I went here. <laughs> okay. Okay, here. Let's just go to Eyes on Asteroids. <laughs> Since uh, here's Eyes on Asteroids. Oh, yeah, I can do what I was getting ready to show you here, too. Um, you see all these little blue specks? I'm rotating our solar system around here. All these little blue specks are asteroids and comets. So, Alan, I think we're still seeing the car. You are? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't want that. I uh, don't want that at all. Huh. I should. Uh, you're still seeing the car. Yeah, we're still seeing the car. I changed that to eyes on asteroids. I wonder why you're seeing the car. I wonder, maybe you have to stop sharing and reshare. Okay, I'll stop sharing and reshare. Okay. Now let's reshare. Uh, there. Now do you see asteroids? Yes. That oh. looks much more like what you were describing. <laughs> okay, yeah. Because <laughs> I was looking at something and I thought you guys were too, but I wasn't showing you guys what I was showing myself. All right. So all these little, again, I'm rotating this around, and you can go in and out to get closer and further away. And Earth is up there somewhere. And you can see that there's uh, tons of asteroids and comets in orbit around the sun with us. And um, you can change if you want to put them in motion. One of the things about the EYES programs, if you go out to um, Jupiter or Saturn or one of these planets that has a whole bunch of dozens of moons, uh, when you look real time, you nothing really in space from a distance looks like it's moving in real time. So you can always change the rate that things are moving. Like you can take this little bar and drag it around here and put everything in motion. Um, and it takes- So we have a question. Do, do you know, um, somebody wants to know what's the biggest asteroid you can find down here? Um, I, I don't know. It might be Ceres, which they call a, what do they call that? A dwarf planet? Or a proto uh, proto planet? Yeah. Um, Maybe a yeah. It's out here somewhere. I could show you that. But um, so you can rotate these around and you can click on anything. While too, we sent a spacecraft to that a few years ago. Um, and one of the things about all the eyes programs, there's all these uh, information things. Like I clicked on this here, the while two asteroid, and um, information comes up. And you can get, oh, here's another cool thing. Up at the top, right there's a thing called asteroid watch and that brings up the next five closest approaches to earth by asteroids and see the screen that came up uh, the little pop-up that came over there on the right it tells you when like january whoops that's today uh <laughs> 15 hours from now we're gonna have a flyby of an asteroid and if you look at it, there it is right there. And you can move around, see where the earth is, find the earth, and you can just watch it fly right by the earth or click right on it and, and zoom in to it. You're supposed to be able to do that. It's freezing up. Oh, I see what I've done. I changed the date. See, see how I can move this bar down at the bottom and go to lots of different dates in the future. It's a little bit different from eyes on um, let's see, eyes on the uh, solar system. That so you can set a date in there, but um, okay, I clicked on Lucy. It's fun. I see, I see Lucy on there. We're going to have a talk about Lucy later yeah. in the week. So that's fun. Yeah, spacecraft. Yeah. 
And again, it needs to be lit up because it's in the dark. And my light up icon is behind my Zoom screen over here, so I can't really get to it. But it's there. There's arrows. Let's see if we can get something I can light up. But that's the asteroid one. And let's go to, again, click on the uh, eyes on asteroids to bring you back to the home screen if you get yourself all messed up. And then I, at a time and date you don't care about and in a place in space where you're lost. <laughs> um, okay, I'm gonna close this and go back to this one, eyes on the solar system. Now I need to stop sharing again or do you see Elon's car? Um, I, it, it looks like it got hung up. Okay. So you might need to stop. I'll, yeah. I'll stop it. That's really stop. fun because I'm like, oh, I'm like, we had a program in Osiris Rex. <laughs> we had, we, we had, I saw a vest on there. I'm like, oh, we had a Vesta Fiesta. It's kind of, it's fun seeing all these things that, you know, we've yeah. been learning about at Astronomy Days and other programs Everything throughout the years. Out here. That's real photography from the Cassini spacecraft. And most everything in Jupiter is real photography from the, Galileo spacecraft. Now, obviously, the spacecraft that are out here and the and the asteroids and comets and things are artist renditions. But whenever possible, uh, we put the um, real stuff in here. Um, That's so cool. So I have uh, a question. Um, Tyler wants to know how were the first asteroids discovered? I don't know. I <laughs> I'm not an astronomer. So if you ask me astronomy questions, I'm going to be like, well, I don't know. <laughs> Now, do we see eyes on the solar system again? Yep, we do. Okay. Um, how much time do we have? Do we have time to go to? Yeah, we are at 1237, so we have, we have time. Okay. So let's go to, I'm going to show you what you get to when you come in. I will go to bring this up. When you first go to eyes.nasa.gov, and you probably don't see that because I need to share again. All right. Your screen. Okay. This is what you get when you go to eyes.nasa.gov. And there's eyes on asteroids, eyes on the solar system, eyes on Earth, eyes on exoplanets. Uh, and then there's, if you want to see the animation for the uh, Mars 2020 robot landing, which is really cool, the seven minutes of terror, how we had, uh, well, I'm not going to spoil it for you. You really ought to go see that if you haven't seen it. It is super cool. Um, but here's eyes on Earth. And eyes on the Earth is um, mostly Earth and stuff that's in orbit, spacecraft that's in orbit around the Earth. And you can, it's live in real time and in real scale. So you can click on where you are and see what space looks like. You can even use this to see what's in the sky outside. Click on where you are and then look at the sky above where you are on the earth. And that's, well, if you want to know what that bright thing is, is that a planet or what is it? Then you can find that. Eyes on exoplanets. Um, I should just show you this. As you know, we have been looking for alien planets around alien stars for a long time. And, and we found like 4,000 of them. Okay, go to full screen. Now this so is- So really Alan, we're, I think we're still, it didn't, it didn't go. Okay. We're still looking on the, all the different eyes programs. Okay. Okay, I'll just go back to, this one seems to work. 
Yeah, exoplanets are really cool. Um, so Rachel was was telling us, Rachel is the muse- one of the museum's astronomers, and she did a program yesterday telling us how there's a lava exoplanet that in the sky sparkles. So it sounded really cool. So the way we find exoplanets is, I want to get this up here to show you. Um, the way we find exoplanets, and as soon as they're found, they're put in here. Yes, yeah, quid. Um, all right. So I should be doing a screen share here in just a second with this. I will stop that and go to this. Okay. Hopefully now you can see it about to load. Um, do you see eyes on exoplanets there? It says go full screen. See, it says, yep, we see it. It looks like we got ah, it. Oh, okay. no. Now we have you again. <laughs> okay. Well, let me tell you about this. The way you find exoplanets, it's mostly what we found is the Kepler Space Telescope. And that is when you've got a star up in the sky, if you look in the sky at night and you see a star and you, it, it's just so bright that what you're really looking at, it's not really the star, it's, it's the glare of the star. The actual star itself is a tiny little thing in the middle of that. And if you put your fingers around it, like your thumb and your first finger around the brightest star you can find, that's not the star, that's the glare. Yes? Yeah, Alan, you're like going crazy here. Oh, oh, I see that. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. Don't look, y'all. <laughs> it's making me queasy. <laughs> oh. Skelly says solar flare interference. Uh, Let's see. I need to do something about that, Donna. Yeah, maybe you need to. Um, <laughs> thanks, thanks, uh, <laughs> thanks, y'all for spotlighting me. Um, maybe Alan, you might need to leave and come back. Okay. Uh, if I screen shared, did that? Let help? me see. Um, well, I can see your screen. Uh, is it, I can only see me. So let me see. Um, oh, you're still going crazy though. I'm going crazy, but do you see my screen? But your screen's fine. <laughs> the exoplanets, the bunch of little yellow stuff in the middle. Yeah, we see the exoplanets. It's just your video is like. Um, I know. I don't know why that's doing that. Wrinkly. I'd call it wrinkly. Wrinkly. Well, I don't really, <laughs> I don't really look that way in real life. Yeah. It went yeah. Off. Well, maybe I. You won't get to see me. That'd be a big tragedy here. But, <laughs> uh, but anyway, eyes on exoplanets. I don't guess you need to see me if you can hear me. Um, yeah, we can hear you fine. Okay, um, this our sun is in the middle of this, and all of these other things out here are exoplanets that we have found and alien stars. So I went to Earth here, the view from the Earth, and I'm gonna do this. How the space, how the Kepler Space Telescope worked, it's really. Oh. Okay, we got it back. We lost audio for a minute. Okay, so. How you're, this is eyes on the earth, and uh, you can rotate around and see where you are. So, so anyway, I was talking about these stars, that, that glare you see of a star, the entire solar system, if there is a solar system around that star, is in that glare, in between your thumb and your first finger. If you're trying to, like, put your fingers around a star, the entire solar system is in there. And most alien stars seem to have solar systems of alien planets. So how are you going to find them? They're way too far away from for a normal spacecraft to find. You have to put, the way they find them is that when a planet orbits a star, if the plant, when, when the planet comes between us and the star, it kind of blocks out a little bit of the starlight and the star blinks. Like if it's got a, if the star orbits once a year, like the earth does around the sun, and you were out looking at from way away, an alien was looking here, and they saw our sun blink once a year, they found the Earth, because Earth is making the star, our sun blink. So to do that, you got to stare at the same bunch of stars for like months or years. You can't have a telescope on the ground because, you know, like we were talking about, we're flying around at like 7,000 miles an hour. It's daytime for a while, and then we're moving. You can't focus a telescope on one place for more than just a few hours at night. 
But if you're a space telescope, you can be up there in orbit and you can point at one thing and keep your telescope pointed there for years if you want. And that's what the Kepler Space Telescope had to do. And it watched all these stars blink as planets went around them. And we found like, oh yeah, here at the bottom, 4,903 confirmed planets in 3,677 alien solar systems. So, and that is only a piece of the sky. The Kepler Space Telescope pointed at a piece of the sky that if you held up a quarter into the night sky, that is a tiny little piece of our, of our own galaxy only and just a tiny fraction of stars in our own galaxy. And we found almost 5,000 planets and almost 4,000 alien solar systems. So there are just in our galaxy, billions and billions and billions of alien planets. And we're putting them in here as fast as we can. <laughs> so, Which is so cool. So we have a few questions about exoplanets. Okay. So someone is asking, have we found exoplanets made of other liquids? Uh, well, we're not finding things um, that we're not, I mean, no, if you mean like, chemicals and liquids and compounds and things that we don't have on earth. Um, not really because the, the earth is, uh, I mean, the periodic table and the atoms and the elements are kind of universal. So uh, we're not going to find anything like, Oh, there's a new atom or there new kind of element, or there's a, you could find different chemical compounds like um, uh, one of the jobs a friend of mine at JPL has in Pasadena is he recreates in alien environments in his laboratory. Like he's recreated a, uh, the, there's a moon of Saturn uh, Titan that has this uh, nasty brown liquid oceans and this nasty brown uh, atmosphere. It's all stuff we have on earth, but not like that not like oceans of it and things. So you find weird mixtures of things, of chemicals that you might find somewhere on earth, but not whole oceans of it. And then when you put all that stuff together, like all these weird compounds that aren't very common here, but if you have oceans of them, under those temperatures and pressures and things, things get really weird. Um, and you get environments that are alien environments, like not what you would find on earth, just because of the weird combinations of, of chemicals and temperatures and pressures and, and radiation environments and things like that. So, yeah, we're finding a lot of um, really crazy, weird alien stuff, but the atoms are all the same as what we have here. So that is just really cool, though. Um, so Marcel wants to know, what makes the cone of information? Um, and I'm assuming... Um, Marcel, if you want to clarify in the chat, but I'll let Alan interpret that. Okay. And I, is it is it like what the telescope can see? Is that maybe? Again, I'm not an astronomer, so I'm not, I'm drawing a blank on what he means. Okay. Well, and we have another question is, do all planets spin? Hmm, not necessarily. It could be like... Um, uh, like our moon is like uh, locked in uh, in its orbit around us where it doesn't, you don't see, that's why we've got a light side and a dark side of the moon. It's like gravity locked. So we don't see like, you know, all the different sides of the moon just spinning around as it orbits us. Um, you do see it because the, some of it's in the dark. But Orbital dynamics are kind of crazy and, and weird. So you, I guess you could have a planet that's, that's not spinning as it rotates. And the tilt that we have for seasons, that's not necessarily going to happen either. And it depends, like a lot of things on Earth, like our tilt and our speed and the seasons and things would be different if we didn't have a moon. So uh, a lot of different factors there. But yeah, anything's possible, I'm sure. <laughs> okay. And um and, and, and we have questions about um about aliens. So if we found any aliens, and I think that to clarify life on a planet other than Earth, um, so we haven't found it yet, but we're still looking, right, Alan? Right. And you know, that's kind of a it's sort of like looking for stuff in space. 
that, uh, and I'm going to go over this tomorrow when we're talking about the James Webb Space Telescope that doesn't look for light like we can see. It looks for things, uh, different kinds of radiation like infrared, which is more like looking for heat than looking for things that are blue and green and white. So if you don't know what you're looking for, sometimes like the universe before we had anything other than just optical telescopes was very small. And we didn't see hardly anything except the stars in the sky, stars and planets in the sky that were, you know, we just saw them a little bit bigger once we got uh, <laughs> telescopes, but you didn't see most of the universe that doesn't really look green or blue or white. It looks X-ray and infrared and gamma, which we can't see. And it wasn't until we started to figure out, hey, we can see a whole lot more stuff if we don't look in the visible range and then there's the whole universe out there once we started looking at everything else. And it's sort of like that with alien life. Like we haven't found life as we know it. And we think that, I mean, the only thing we know is the kind of life we have here. It's all based on carbon. It's all got the same chromosome, DNA, RNA kind of stuff going on, everything here. And it all needs water and it all needs a nice temperature that's not too extreme. Um, but, and we know how to look for that stuff because we live amongst it. But suppose you've got some crazy alien environment that has led to life that is maybe not based on carbon, maybe doesn't need uh, water, maybe it can live much hotter and much colder, maybe it eats metal, like a metal eating fish that somebody was talking about eating asteroids. Could be something like that. And we don't know to look for that. And also, we're barely able to just see alien planets. They're so far away, and we're looking for that blink thing when a planet goes in front of a star and makes it blink. So we're kind of, we're just now starting to figure out how to tell what kind of planets those are. And that's that would be a, a that's real interesting stuff, how scientists can look at this information from light years away and see a star blink like that, and then from how fast it moves and how much it blinks to be able to tell all this stuff, whether it's got an atmosphere or how big it is, how whether it's a rocky planet or a lava planet or a water planet. That's real interesting how they figure that. And it's a little bit like in the museum, you look at these dinosaur uh, uh, things and the scientists go, oh, this dinosaur could run 30 miles an hour and it only ate petunias and daffodils. How do they know that? That's really fascinating. Once you talk to the dinosaur people at the museum, how did you know that this dinosaur only ate daffodils and it could run 30 miles an hour? And when they tell you, it's fascinating. It's amazing. And this scientist uh, figuring out about exoplanets, it's the same thing. It's You take this information and you figure out crazy things from it like that. It's really amazing. But no, we haven't found alien life. <laughs> I took about 10 minutes to answer that question, that yes or no question, didn't I? No. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't found alien life. We so we have a few, we have a, a few more questions. So I heard that the um, JWST is going to look for artificial light on Proxima Centauri B. Is that true? Uh, I haven't heard of that, but I wouldn't doubt it because uh, the James Webb Space Telescope is a little bit like Hubble in that, uh, you know, NASA sends up the space telescope and then NASA tells all the astronomers and scientists around the world, hey, you want to use this thing? What do you want to point at? And what are you looking for? And NASA uh, looks at all of these different proposals from astronomers and scientists all over the world and they think, oh, that's real interesting. Well, let them do that. And, oh, this is... This guy wants to look for planet eating metal fish. No, no, <laughs> don't let him do that. Um, so NASA, they, with any of these big observatories, space telescopes, and James Webb and Hubble are not the only two. There have been a bunch more that you only have so much time to point it at things and look at things. And there are people at NASA that make decisions on what scientist gets how much time to do his thing. And that looking for artificial light around Proxima Centauri or Alpha Centauri, one of those, uh, that would be really cool. Uh, but one of the things they would have to look at would be to look at data on if there were cities on one of the planets around one of those stars 
the light that would be emitted. I mean, again, it's like uh, we know how much Los Angeles lights up space above it, but what if what if that alien culture around in that planet around Proxima Centauri had been real uh, sensitive to light pollution, and they've decided to uh, you know not do so much light pollution? It might be darker, or maybe these aliens that live there they see only ultraviolet light. Like some of our birds of prey do that. They they look they can see ultraviolet light. But suppose you had a planet of aliens that only saw an ultraviolet light and their light bulbs and things didn't give off white light. They gave off ultraviolet light. Well, uh, James Webb's not going to see that. Uh, James Webb will barely see things in the visible range. James Webb is looking in the infrared range. So the scientists may say uh, to the person that wants to look at light on... Proxima Centauri that, yeah, you know, you might see it and you might not. Chances are eh, too risky. Let's let, no, forget it. Let's let somebody else use the telescope. <laughs> so, so NASA, I, I mean, so Alan, I have just like, <laughs> I'm calling you NASA. I just have a, um, a one more question um, before we wrap it up for the day. So Tyler wants to know how many of these planets are in the habitable zone that, that are in the habitable zone habitable zone are likely to um, harbor life. And I think that um, maybe our, we have a talk about the Fermi paradox <laughs> um, and the Drake equation um, later in the week. So maybe you can drop that link in the chat. But Alan, what do you think? How many, how many do you think could possibly have life on them? Well, on eyes on exoplanets, there is, uh, I don't know if you can see this, but I brought up an exoplanet. Let me try to get zoomed in a little bit here. And you see that green disc around it? That's the habitable zone. And that's on eyes on exoplanets, uh, we do have that here. It's uh, the habit, but, but again, that's like our habitable, habitable zone around our sun used to be start kind of at Venus and go out to Mars because we're thinking that life needs water and it needs uh, moderate temperatures and things. But now we find this moon of Jupiter, uh, Europa, that's got this ice crust on the outside and warm ocean water underneath. It's kept melted by the uh, you know, volcanic activity and the uh, geothermal energy. So it's got more ocean water that's warm and you could swim in it than we have on Earth. And that's way outside our Goldilocks zone, what we call it, you know, habitable zone. Goldilocks zone, you know, Goldilocks and the three wild pigs or whatever that story was. Um, the pizza's not too cold, it's not too hot. Um, so we don't know. I mean, this these habitable zones we've drawn here for you on Eyes on Exoplanets are our guests. But if it's some alien that's uh, got different environmental requirements that it grew up with, then... We don't really know. The habitable zones are probably bigger than we think because now we could include Jupiter in ours, the Jupiter system, maybe even Saturn. Um, so, yeah, it could be there. There are literally billions and billions and billions of planets in our galaxy alone that are potentials that you wouldn't want to rule out life there. And I just, and so, um, Maybe, uh, so everybody in the chat wants you to know that it's bears, not pigs, Alan. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and then also- That's not the, um, that's not the way my grandmother it, told me. It was three, the, the, the bears ate the grandmother and uh, only <laughs> locked ate the pizzas or- it, Yes, I feel like there's, uh, on, there's only one. <laughs> <laughs> It's all just one. Um, so what? So the Drake. Do you want to explain quickly what the Drake equation is? Because we had it. Um, we, they um, some folks in the Raleigh Astronomy Club had a computer set up with the Drake equation on it, and we could and you could go in there and put in your, you know, like your guesses on different things. And I ha I have I have some sad news. I ended up with zero. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but the, but can you tell folks the what the Drake, the Drake equation, equation is? is? It keeps changing all the time, and the numbers keep getting bigger because we are learning. I mean, when they originally came out with the Drake equation, that uh, that was back when back in the '60s, I think, when we had no idea how many uh, solar systems were around other stars, and now we do. 
And when we started finding them, we're like, wow, that's unusual. Now we're learning, no, that's not unusual. It seems like maybe in the formation of stars that a solar system is normal and most stars have them. So those numbers you plug into the Drake equation just keep getting bigger and bigger as we realize, you know, we used to think there was probably about three or four solar systems in the galaxy, and now there might be billions. So, uh, Oh, good. So that means, so if I did it today, I wouldn't get zero. That makes well, me feel better. Hopefully not. Zero <laughs> not. would include us, too. <laughs> Oh no! <laughs> I don't know what I did. I was very disappointed because I really want there to be life out there. The um, numbers well, are just crazy. I mean, uh, I've heard people say, if you just start writing a bunch of zeros after one, and these are the odds that it's, it's like, oh, one in 10 trillion, uh, just make up a big number. There's one in 10 trillion uh, stars that have habitable planets with life on them then we've still got millions of planets in our galaxy alone that have life on planets. That's what I think. It's just too big for it not to be out there. We well, Alan, we are over design. time, oh, unfortunately. Right. I'm so sorry. Um, and uh, But I do want to say thank you so much for doing this and taking us through these super cool programs. I know that it, that some people in the chat were already, have already been exploring them as you were talking. Um which is really, really cool. So what a neat thing to introduce all of us to. And I hope everybody goes home and plays with these programs and explores the universe because um, it is really neat stuff. Uh, so I do want to, um, so thank you, Alan. And I want to thank our sponsors and North Carolina Space Grant and Pepsi. And I also want to thank our museum members because Without our members, programs like this are not possible. So thank you members. And if you're not a member, please consider joining the museum and helping support cool things like Astronomy Days. Um, I noticed in the chat before I started my outro that someone was asking if we have any in-person Astronomy Days activities this year, and we do not. We are 100% virtual. Um, but today's only the second of seven days. So we are going all the way through Sunday and we have programs throughout the days, every day. So go to our website and check that out. Um, and I hope I will see you at a program um, either later today or one of the next days. So thank you, everyone. Happy Astronomy Days. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Alan. Thanks, Carrie. Thanks, everybody, for joining. <laughs>